Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our introduction to Brazil. Today, I'm continuing with week six, which deals with the uh, war, World War I, the Depression, and the dictatorship of Getulio Vargas in the first half of the 20th century, 1910 to 1945. So let's jump in and get started. This is taken from Thomas Skidmore's book, Brazil, Five Centuries of Change, Chapter 5, World War I, Depression, and the Dictatorship, 1910 to 1945. The outline of what we're going to look at today is the shock of World War I, the post-war economy, new currents in the 1920s, the Prestige Column, Brazilian-style modernism, the disintegration of the old politics, the Revolution of 1930, and Getulio Vargas as a dictator, and under his authoritarian rule, ideological polarization, corporatism, and Estado Novo. That's a lot to cover in a few minutes. So the Brazilian elite had always admired and imitated Europe. So the outbreak of World War I came as a shock. It also provided a catalyst to the efforts of the nationalist movement of Brazil to spread the doctrine that Brazil could only thrive by recognizing and playing on the uh, playing up its own identity. Interestingly enough, Brazil followed the United States into the war on the side of the Allies in World War I. Uh, so that is both World War I and World War II, Brazil was uh, fought on the Allied side, one of the few Latin American republics to do so, the only one in World War I. Uh, Brazil's hopes that such an act would increase its influence in the world stage were dashed, partly because of the failure of the League of Nations, which was Woodrow Wilson's, Wilson's uh, vision. But the post-war economic surge did help Brazil industrialize, although unevenly. Uh, what what uh, Brazil began to develop or play around with was the idea of a corporatist state. In 1930, the military, playing on the increasing critiques of democracy, took power in a bloodless coup, as they most often are in Brazil, and stalled Getulio Vargas as the dictator. We'll come back and talk more about that. But as a consummate political strategist, Vargas kept popularity as well as power through the 1930s and into World War II and even into a few years into the 1950s. And World War II, Brazil again intervened on the side of the Allies. During much of this period, he built a corporatist state. Now, this is not the same as a fascist state. A corporatist state is one based on a hierarchical, organic view of society. In particular, a corporatist labor movement with symmetrical associations of employees and workers, and the state is the arbiter between them. I think that should say employers and workers. So on the one hand, you have your employers. On the other hand, you have your workers. And the state sets up these workers' organizations, and employers' organizations, and is the arbiter between them instead of letting them uh, letting the free market work. Uh, so a corporate state views the society kind of like an org organic, uh, uh, an organic entity. Like a, like a human body with a heart and lungs and arms and legs and tries to create harmony between them. World War I came as a shock to Brazil. Uh, like the United States, Brazil was jolted out of its passivity by the German High Command's decision in 1917 to launch unrestricted submarine warfare in the Atlantic. The Brazilian Congress finally chose to join the Allies, making Brazil the only Latin American belligerent in the Great War. And this had some uh, major effects on the economy. Historians have long argued that the restriction of trade caused by World War I stimulated the Brazilian industrialization. However, there's been some doubt cast upon that recently. Nevertheless, the Brazilian elite hoped that their entry into the war would bring their country world world-class status as a major power. Argentina was Brazil's big rival in the international stage, but it remained neutral in World War II. To some extent, Argentina was sympathetic with the, uh, with the Germany. 
The economy after the war, the First World War dramatized a change in the pattern of world trade that had begun before 1914. Most important was the relative decline in, the Brit in Britain's world economic position uh, re in relation to Germany and the United States. So Great Britain was beginning to uh, falter economically with its world empire. Germany and the United States were rapidly industrializing. The momentum sustaining Britain's rise to world economic predominance in the 19th century had irretrievably slowed. This tends to happen to global powers. They rise and then they fall. It was still Brazil's primary foreign investor, but it was losing ground to the United States and to Germany. The Brazilian Communist Party came into being around 1922, just a few years after the Russian Revolution. It was a significant develop development within the labor movements and the left, the founding of the PCB, uh, Partido Comunista Brasileira. The PCB subsequently succeeded in recruiting many of the former anarcho-syndicalists who had dominated the urban labor organization before the war. By 1930, the PCB was to become the best organized force on the left. The economic diversification following World War I had extremely uneven effects. Industrialization was concentrated in the south, in the southeast, especially in the triangle formed by the states of Minas Gerais, Rio de Janeiro, and São Paulo. And also between 1900 and 1940, Brazil continued to see a significant shift in population from the northeast of Brazil, the uh, Bahia, Pernambuco, the former sugar producing uh, area of Brazil, uh, which was in decline, and the population moved seeking work and employment to the south and southeast. The northeast had declined along with the sugar industry. The Amazon Basin was another area on the margin of development. It had enjoyed a boom based on the rubber production, but that bubble burst in 1912 when competing sources of natural rubber came onto the world market. Brazil at this time was still overwhelmingly rural, even though it was rapidly uh, urbanizing. In spite of the diversification and major economic growth in the urban regions of the South and Southeast, Brazil remained predominantly a rural country. As late as 1940, less than a third of Brazil was urban. Transportation was difficult and slow, with less than 1,800 miles of paved highway, highways in the whole country. And it's a huge country, by the way. Newspapers were only available for the wealthier, literate Brazilians in the larger cities. So you had a lot of rural isolation in the interior. The 1920s saw an increasing uh, philosophical and political discontent with uh, Western liberalism that had been the underlying influence of the Brazilian Republic since its creation in 1889. This was similar to other parts of uh, Europe and the United States, there was also a certain uh, malaise or discontent with the uh, modern world order. The military were active participants in this rest of discussion. The army had had no foreign combat experience since the Paraguayan War 40 years earlier, with the exception of Canudos in 1891, which they uh, disastrously lost to a group of uh, backwoods peasants. The army commanders knew their equipment was obsolete and discontent was growing within the military ranks. Tenente is the Brazilian word for lieutenant. Tenente is in the barracks revolts. So this, this is the beginning of a discontent with the lower officer ranks, which were called lieutenants or tenentes. Discontent was growing within these younger new officers their anger eventually burst forth in what's what's known as barracks revolts. The first one was in 1922 at the Copacabana Beach Fort. I've been there. It's a fascinating history. If you get a chance to go, a group of officers, rather than surrendering uh, after losing a battle, marched up 
Copacabana Beach in an act of defiance. Uh, late, the, later in 1924, the most famous barracks revolt was called the Prestige Column and it involved a group of lieutenants and their soldiers taking a march through the interior of Brazil in protest to Brazilian uh, governmental and military policies. It was a three-year march beginning in 1924, and the, the uh, Brazil's federal government was com showed itself completely incapable of finding them, apprehending them, stopping them, and so it was a quite a statement of statement about uh, the current condition of Brazil. The bar these barracks revolts, and there were a number of them in the 1920s, they revealed several things about the condition of the military and the attitude of young soldiers. First, that there was a profound lack of discipline in the army. Secondly, the, the federal army was completely ineffective. Thirdly, the revolts showed a profound disillusionment of the younger generation. And fourth, the prestige column showed the weakness of the civilian political elite. This is in the Roaring Twenties, after the First World War, before the Great Depression, and before the Second World War. Uh, discontent grew within the military ranks. The benchmark year dating Brazil's entry into what became known as modernism was in 1922, the same year as one of the barracks revolts. In February of 1922, there was a modern art week festival held in the city of Sao Paulo. It was led by Mario Giandrade. I'm pronouncing this Rio, Rio de Janeiro style. Mario de Andrade would be another way to pronounce it. He was a multi-talented multi mulatto artist, playwright, and musician, also from Sao Paulo. This coincided with uh, the beginnings of a change towards of attitudes towards Afro-Brazilians. The artistic revolt was fed also by a new post-war attitude towards the Afro-Brazilian. The early republic had been dominated by the dogma of whitening, somewhat similar to Argentina, an elite belief that accept elite belief in the accepted scientific superiority of whites. And it assumed that Brazil would eventually bleach out the non-white element over time. They were wrong, by the way. Afro-Brazilian and art and religion were viewed as primitive and barbaric. This was the older attitude at the end of the 19th century with what is known as scientific racism, social Darwinianism, and positivism. But now in 1922, attitudes are beginning to change. People are rethinking some of this. One of the uh, profound uh, and influential thinkers of the uh, generation that came uh, came to uh, dominance in 1920s was Gilberto Freire. Freire. I have trouble pronouncing that last name. He represented a new generation of Brazilian thinkers after World War I. He was from Pernambuco. He was a writer and a sociologist who began publishing in the early 1920s his pioneering analysis of Brazilian social history. His uh, master, uh, master work was uh, The Masters and Slaves, first published in 1933. Combined with that of like-minded writers, artists, and scientists resulted in a radical reorienta reorientation of elite thought about race in Brazil. Now, for people in 19, uh, I'm sorry, for people in 2022, when uh, young people read The Masters and Slaves, they often are struck by it and struck by some of its descriptions as being somewhat racist. Uh, however, that's because rhetoric has changed. In the context of 1920s, Gilberto Freire was arguing for the value and the dignity of the Afro-Brazilian contribu contribution to Brazilian society. And it was uh, considered progressive, not racist in the time. The non-white element, especially the African element, was now seen as a positive factor in Brazilian social formation, partly due to Gilberto Freire's book, The Masters and Slaves. 
racist conceptions were increasingly replaced with emphasis on the roles of health and education and unequal development. The result of this intellectual reversal was to reinforce the transformation of Brazilian culture associated with the modernist movement. There was also a corresponding rise in anti-liberal sentiment, which is interesting because I think we're seeing that currently in uh, American society, in U.S. American society. The Brazilians increasingly focus on the alleged defects of the liberal political system. By liberal in this context is talking about checks and balances, a constitutional order, uh, regular uh, elections, free elections, the peaceful change of uh, uh, change of power. A second was a disappointment at the failure of the economy to grow more rapidly, attributed by many to the faults of the political system. By the 1920s, Brazil's inability to keep up or to match the United States and Argent the Argentine development was evident to all. Uh, this was at a time that Argentina was uh, was uh, rapidly ascending in its economic production in the world order. This was going to change a few years later. But in the 1920s, Argentina was doing better than Brazil. The disintegration of the old politics. The decentralization stimulated by the 1891 Constitution, if you remember, the king, uh, the, the emperor had been deposed and had gone into exile in Europe in 1889, uh, right after the slavery was abolished, and uh, Brazilian politicians got together and created a new constitution based on elections and, uh, and a rep republican form of government. But that, uh, that constitution had greatly decentralized uh, Brazilian uh, federal structure, resulting in fragmentation of the federal authority just as capitalism was facing increasingly severe tests of its viability. The weakness of the National Army had stimulated the states to build up their own military forces. In some cases, the states had a stronger military than the federal government, which, as you might imagine, would be problematic. Most importantly, elections had lost their perceived legitimacy as a means of allocating political power in Republican Brazil. Uh, this is some echoes with what we're experiencing right now in 2022, in which uh, in both in 2016 and in 2020, there were uh, severe doubts and questions about the legitimacy of the elections. Imagine if the state of Texas and the state of California had a stronger military National Guard than the federal government. Uh, we could be living through some very uh, turbulent times. We are anyway. Uh, it, it was in this environment that Getulio Vargas took power and initiated an authoritarian rule of about 20 years. The preparations for the presidential campaign of 1929 occurred amid even more than usual suspicion and manipulation. The previous two presidencies and elections had been problematic and had created questions in the minds of many of the elite. The opposition nominated Getulio Vargas, who was a former federal finance minister and was the governor at that time of Rio Grande do Sul. Getulio Vargas himself reached Rio with his comrades. The junta handed power over to Vargas as provisional pre president. I skipped over a little bit there. Uh, he ran for office. Uh, it became clear that Washington Lewis, who was the, the current president of Brazil, was not inclined to hand over power, that he was uh, in, intent on handing power to his hand-picked candidate. Uh, Getulio Vargas's presidential uh, president, vice president was assassinated, and so a number of the states then launched their their uh, National Guard out, sent their militaries to Rio, Rio de Janeiro, and the Cardinal, uh, the Cardinal Leme of Brazil convinced Washington Lewis to stand down and to leave office, and so uh, Getulio Vargas was placed in power as the new president of Brazil in 1930 by a military coup, not by the election.
The world financial crisis of, I'm sorry, the world financial crash of 1929 had created a powerful economic rationale for strengthening the central government of Brazil, which was badly needed. Vargas seized this moment. He dissolved the Congress. He instituted an emergency regime, and he assumed full policymaking authority via decree, executive orders, basically. He was strongly supported by the newly ascended general, army generals, led by the ambitious military. Remember, they were dissatisfied. Uh, and they felt like they had not been modernized, they didn't have proper equipment, and so they were very dissatisfied and ready for to try something different. So Vargas basically dissolves the Congress and sets up an emergency regime and begins to rule by decree. This led to a period of extreme ideological polarization. Keep in mind that the same thing was going on at that time in Europe. In the 1920s and early 30s in Europe, there was a growing polarization between the, the left and the right. On the left was the uh, Marxists, uh, uh, the, the, Soviet, uh, the Soviet Union-inspired Communist Party, as well as Socialist Parties. On the left, who were uh, recruiting working-class people. On the right was the Fascist Party of Italy and uh, the Nazi Party in Germany. In Spain and Portugal, you had corporatist parties that were authoritarian but aligned with the Catholic Church. And so you have this ideological polarization. Again, something similar to what we're experiencing today in 2022. On the left was the Partido Comunista Brasileiro, or the PCB, led by Luis Carlos Prestes. I don't know if you remember his name, but he was the leader of the Prestes Column that uh, group of young lieutenants that took a three-mile march through the interior of Brazil. I said three miles. A three-year march through the interior of Brazil uh, in 1924. And he rocketed to fame as the leader of that protest against uh, the old order. He now was the leader of the uh, PCB or the Partido Comunista Brasileiro. It was founded in 1922. It was under the supervision of the Comintern in Moscow, the, the Communist International. In the early 1930s, the party followed the Comintern line of all-out struggle against the forces of fascism. On the right, we have also several groups that were organizing. In the 1920s, was the Brazilian Roman Catholic Church was going through a period of strengthening the church and church renewal. It had been a very weak institution in the 19th century, and part of that was the uh, was a lay-led lay organization called Catholic Action. And by the 1930s, the revived church was exerting new political force on the right, and uh, a, an organization that was created that had a great affinity. It was not officially a Catholic organization, but it had a great affinity with the Catholic Church, was the Acción Integra Integralista Basileira. AIB, or the Brazilian Integralist Action Party. Integralist usually refers to some kind of corporatism where society is seen as an organic whole and all the parts contributing to it. Acção Integralista Brasileira. Its members wore green uniforms and they had quasi-military hierarchy and they engaged in paramilitary parades and exercises. They relished street confrontations on the left. The Integralista vision of a Christian Brazil based on, their vision was for a Christian Brazil based on a disciplined society with little tolerance for the revolutionary action of the left. But they weren't properly fascist in the fullest sense because they weren't, uh, the racism was not a central part of their platform nor was Brazilian expansionism. Uh, and usually the fascist parties had a uh, Fuhrer or a strongman leader like Mussolini. The communists and the integralists saw themselves as natural antagonists. They staged marches, countermarches, and street fights, paralleling what was happening in Central Europe. This ideological radicalization helped contribute to the public's growing doubts about the effectiveness of electoral politics.
again, Shades of Today with Antifa and the Proud Boys and some of the groups that are arising on the left and the right. When all this, uh, all this was starting to come to a head, when in 1935 there was a attempted uprising by the communist uh, officers within the military and enlisted men within the Brazilian army. Instructions for carrying out the revolt were given to Luis Carlos Prestes in Moscow. The common turn in the PCB, who were apparently unaware that they were already under surveillance, surveillance by the Brazilian police, had unwittingly played into Vargas's hands. They had given him an ex the perfect excuse for a crackdown, and crackdown he did. And uh, it was, I, I'm going to end the lecture there for the sake of time, but uh, not long after that, he also cracked down on the uh, Integralist Party and dispersed and disbanded them and instituted the Estado Novo, the new state, which was his own authoritarian project to uh, create a quasi-corporate state. And from there, they entered into World War II, eventually on the side of the Allies, which complicated the uh, complicated his role as a dictator after World War II when there was such a strong emphasis on democracy around the world. Okay, that's week six. I'll be back with you next week on the next phase of Brazilian history. Thank you. Take care.